it is my pleasure to introduce our president and CEO, Dr. Gary Weitzman. Gary, take it away. Thank you, Alex. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, second Alex's sentiment. It'd be so great to see all of you in person tonight, but this is really what we're all getting used to in this new world of all of these little square boxes that we're all in. So let me just fix my screen here. I hope everybody can hear okay, but I'm really delighted to have everybody here tonight. This is our first Humane Leader Circle lecture of the summer. I'm still thinking it's March 2nd. That's when time seemed to have stopped, but we've had a number of these already for different groups. But this is a really special one tonight. This is not only one of the most important issues in animal welfare that not only San Diego Humane, but the entire country, I'll even say the world, is facing with animals, that is community cats. But we're also lucky enough to have one of my favorite people on the planet and really the foremost expert in how to humanely change the way we, and, and brilliantly change, the way we deal with, with uh, cats that live outdoors. So we're gonna talk about that, but I think a lot of you got my email from yesterday. But we've been talking about this for almost a year, about launching this new program to take care of cats in a much different way. And I'm just gonna, I just wanna say one thing. It hit me last fall, and I hope that Dr. Hurley can hear this story because she, she'll, she'll really relate to it. I was driving down through Ocean Beach on the way to work and I was going to Starbucks and I was just going down Santa Cruz or Coronado uh, Avenue and these two cats just bolted in front of my car far enough away that there was no, no issue of, of hurting them. But I just watched them. They were having the time of their lives. They weren't running away from any predator. They weren't running away from my car. They were running into the next yard where they started to actually play, look like hide and seek with each other through bushes. Now, we all know that cats actually may have other <laughs> intentions when it looks like they're playing. But my point is they were really thriving. And I realized this is so bizarre. If, we, if I saw two dogs doing that, I'd have to get out of my car. I'd be calling all of our humane officers. Uh, we'd be stopping traffic. There was no traffic except for me and they were pretty safe for me. But it just struck me that it's a whole new way we need to look at cats that are outdoors because we cannot treat them the way we treat dogs. And so we've been aiming for this uh, for about a year. And thank you, Dr. Hurley, for actually spurring the whole nation to consider new ways to take care of cats. There you are. It's good to see you. But we've been aiming for this for a year and we wanted to go through uh, legislative uh, challenges that we might be facing, legal challenges. Uh, sorry, my uh, plane flying over my, my window here. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, doing any CEQA. Uh, uh, we didn't have to have a CEQA uh, uh, issues that we have to deal with. There, there are complex issues here with not just the cats and how we think of them, whether they're outdoor or indoor cats, but also their effect on the world, on nature, uh, obviously on wildlife, which we care deeply about, also in San Diego Humane. So it's, it's very complicated. So we started to launch this last fall and we had all these focus groups. And I'll tell you, the most difficult ones were our staff and our volunteers, many of whom are on this call, myself, who really thought, all cats should be safe and sound, and we needed to treat them all like dogs, honestly, until about Thanksgiving of last year. But I've been listening to what we've been doing with Community Cats and Dr. Hurley for a long, long time, and we really need to change the way we do this. So we, we were waiting to go through all of the legislative and legal hurdles and make sure we were doing this in the best way. And then COVID hit. And then everything changed because all of a sudden we had a community cat program because the cats weren't coming in, except for the spay neuter part, which is so clearly important. But the cats weren't coming in and we knew that we had to find more, we had to find better ways to take care of them. So it's interesting, COVID, while it's been treacherous and horrifying and, and devastating, there has been a silver lining in a lot of ways that we never would have expected. So tonight you're going to get really a treat and hear uh, one of my favorite people in the world talk about something that we all think of her as the queen or the wizard of cats, all cats, whether they're community cats or indoor cats. And uh, that's uh, my friend and colleague, Kate Hurley. And I saw her last in person on my very last trip, which was the end of February up in Sacramento. Uh, we were going, we were at the State House, 
and I just said, hey, can you help us with um, some of the issues that we want to answer about community cats? And at the same time, Alex had, I think, contacted you, Kate, about actually coming down to talk with us in person and have this, have this event in person. And I really just regret that we can't do it in person. So we owe you a dinner, and we probably owe you a good San Diego IPA. And we promise you that as soon as it's safe to do that. But it is such a pleasure to welcome you tonight to um, about probably about 80 of our, our closest friends and um, really looking forward to, to hearing you talk about Community Cats. Let me just give you a little background on Kate. And I think I'll miss a lot of things, but Kate started out as uh, an animal control officer in Santa Cruz. And I think you're gonna talk a little bit about your bio as well. So I won't worry about getting all the details. Then you became a veterinarian and was that in, should I give a date? I probably shouldn't give a date, should I? Okay, I'll let you do that. 1999. Okay, all right. I was hard to say, believe, hard okay. to believe. Seems like everything's yesterday, hard, truly. Everything's hard to believe these days. Became a veterinarian yeah. and then not just a vet, but also, um, but then became um, one of the really world's first shelter medicine specialists in infectious disease and especially in cats. And along with a few colleagues, but she is the queen, um, did the uh, set out to, to launch the community, uh, sorry, the Million Cat Challenge, which was probably 2011, something like that, 12, maybe a little bit later. 14. 14, okay, all right, okay, 14, <laughs> which seems like 100 years ago. And the Million Cat Challenge yep. did exactly what it says, it actually saved over a million cats. And that's when we um, hooked our banner onto anything that Dr. Hurley does because she really is a, a brilliant and very compassionate uh, expert in uh, cats and infectious disease and shelter medicine. And we're just really thrilled to have you here tonight, Kate. So thank you, I'll turn it over to you. You can do a much better job of your background and I know you, you will probably on your presentation, but we're all thrilled and honored to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all for inviting me here this evening and taking a little time out of your busy quarantine week to, to do this with us. Um, really, you know, Gary gave some of my background, but I just, as, as he was talking, I, I, I found this. Can you see this? Um, I found this in some stuff that is like a, a picture I drew when I was like six. Um, I was say, there's the sun door? <laughs> is a cat. And there's a cloud as a cat, and there's a cat on top of Mount Cat, and another cat riding a cat. Um, so somehow, um, I am really just a cat-loving kid. My name is Kate. My nickname was Cat when I was a kid. Um, and somehow I grew up to be in the body of this 55-year-old veterinarian. But at heart, that really is who I am. And And in light of that, like, I just love cats. I really do. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but um, a cat was my best friend growing up. Her name was Pussy Willow, and we moved a lot. And um, just that steady companionship, I think, is really what taught me to to be able to love, to be able to connect, to be able to commit, um, just to become who I am you know, to be able to be someone who has something to contribute to the world. I really put a lot of that to the account of Pussy Willow, who I had from when I was five until when I was 10 years old. Um, and when I started working in animal shelters in 1989, so like 100 years ago, <laughs> um, one out of four cats that came in left alive. And 10 years ago, in California, those odds were unchanged. They were unchanged. And it was hard to be a cat lover involved in animal sheltering. And it did feel like they were sort of the second class species. Animal sheltering was invented for dogs. And it worked, you know, we were making headway between 2000 and 2010. Certainly between when I started in 1989 and 2010, things had transformed for dogs. You know, where dog, old dogs and funky looking dogs and dogs with no hair at all and dogs with bad behavior, they were all getting home. And still the cats were struggling. Until about 10 years ago when we really, we understood an approach. And here, this is Baldwin Parkey, um, my one-eyed pirate cat. He'll be joining us today as he joins anything now. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate something for you. 
is my, here's my desk. And we do this all day long now. He arrives from the left side of my desk and I remove him from the right side. But I don't change anything about the environment at my desk and he will reappear because that's how it is. <laughs> so as, as I get into the slides, um, you'll see a little bit more about why that, why that is so important with cats and with our community cat management practices. But what I want to get to saying really is that the answer to cats turned out to be such an unbelievable win, 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 win situation. It turned out to be cheaper than what we were already doing. It turned out to be more humane for the cats. It turned out to be better for wildlife. It turned out to be more just and equitable for our underserved communities. And it turned out to be way better for shelters. And it turned out to be way better for the cats that do need homes. And it turned out to be way better for the cats that don't need new homes because they already have a home. Um, the hardest thing about it is that it's just is counterintuitively too good to be true. You see how that works? He's back. <laughs> and I just, before I launch into the slides, uh, since I have the power to share my screen here, um, I just wanted to show you where the Million Cat Challenge is today. As Gary said, um, we did not save a million cats. We did not save two million cats. As of today, North American animal shelters in the Million Cat Challenge have reduced euthanasia against each shelter's own baseline before joining the Million Cat Challenge by 2,510,277 cats. They did it that without a billion dollar grant. You know, they did that without an act of Congress. They did it by shifting our way of thinking so that we don't manage cats like problematic little dogs. We manage cats like cats. So with that, um, if it's all right with everybody, I'll just dive into the slides. So welcome to the 2020 San Diego Humane virtual lecture series. Dr. Hurley, does this mean you'll be doing this every quarter for us? I'm happy to. Okay. <laughs> I could go on and on. Um, and I haven't changed this slide. I've been doing this presentation for um, 10 years now. Um, and I haven't changed the cover slide, although I've changed almost everything else in it. And it's still, it's just such a pleasure. It's like Christmas. Every time I give this presentation, I'm like, oh my God, this works. We can do this for cats. So I'll take you back to um, me. Same haircut, I can't blame the quarantine for this. At the time I actually worked part-time at a dog grooming shop. So um, that is a puppy cut number two if you wanna go into your dog groomer and ask for that after the quarantine permits that. Um, but uh, you know, one of my jobs was to bring in cats. And um, in fact, no. Sorry, my cat just picked up my glasses and dropped them off the table. Um, and, you know, that cat, like so many, had a one in four chance of leaving my shelter alive. But I did it in the deep belief that that was the best way I could keep cats safe from the harms that would come to them. I was in Santa Cruz where there's a lot of coyotes and um, other hazards for cats. It's on the edge of the Monterey Bay where there's sea otters who are... Uh, very affected by toxoplasmosis, and cats are the only natural host of that. And that is my other favorite animal besides cats. And so I felt like our role to to bring cats in and remove them from the environment was really important for protecting sea otters. Like San Diego Humane, we also had a wildlife rehabilitation facility within the within the shelter. Um, and so it's also my job to pick up the animals that, that have been injured by cats. And so important to me you know I wasn't just there for my favorite species I was there for all the species and I was there for all the people too in the community who were who were woken up at night by cats yelling and had cats peeing on their barbecue grill and all the other issues that cats were creating in the community and when I brought in a cat you know if you think about it um, the first goal is return to owner right that's what we want when we bring in a stray animal our goal is to get it back to its original home uh, and you probably know about how well that works out for cats. But 
we would have a stray holding period. And the goal of that holding period was to give the family an opportunity to come and get their cat back. And then if that didn't work out after three days, if the cat was behaviorally suited to adoption, wasn't too feral, we would move the cat up for adoption. And if the cat didn't get adopted or wasn't suitable for adoption, then the cat would be humanely euthanized. And I did that too, um, because I wasn't willing to go to this final step of suffering or a painful death for the cat or causing unacceptable problems or risks, whether for people or for animals in the community. So it was a pretty straightforward cascade of events. And it was something that I was, you know, when I went to vet school and when I became the world's first resident in shelter medicine, and then when I directed the world's first university shelter medicine program and we consulted with shelters, still that was the path that I believed in. Bring the cat in, try to return it to the owner, try to adopt it. We got better and better at all of those things, but still if it's one too many or if it gets too sick or if it's too feral, then we need approach was developed, which added a different option. I'm like trying to move my little screen around. You know, it's slight technical difficulty. Okay, we got it. We're good. Um, and San Jose, this was first done in Jacksonville, but San Jose was the first shelter in California to, to do this. And they actually started this program in 2009, um, but they spay neuter, ear tip, vaccinate, and put stray cats back where they came from. They just put them right back, regardless of whether the person who brought them in wanted that to happen or not. So we slipped in between return to owner adoption. If these didn't work out, we slipped in a third choice before we got to humane euthanasia. And when I saw this, the former animal control officer in me was like, no way. People are going to lose their minds. They're going to be enraged. There's going to be cats everywhere. This is going to be a fiasco. Like, what about all the reasons why I was bringing cats into the shelter in the first place? Why do you think I did that hard work? Not because I wanted to do that to cats, but because we had important reasons to avoid the suffering and the problems caused by in the community by free roaming cats. But they did it. They didn't ask my permission, and it worked. Euthanasia decreased by 75%. Wow. That's transformative. It's transformative for the staff. It's transformative for the animals that do need the care of that shelter. It's transformative for the volunteers. It's transformative for the community to have a shelter they can look to where they, they know the animals they bring in there will be safe from euthanasia, right? So that's profound. Euthanasia due to upper respiratory infection, my nemesis. And San Diego Humane Society, y'all are rock stars in helping to solve the problem of upper respiratory infection. I can tell you that story sometime. But um, it is a disease of crowding and stress, and it was reduced by 99% from over 900 cats euthanized at that shelter due to upper respiratory infection to fewer than 90. So that was profound. But here was the most amazing thing. Contrary to my expectation that there would be more cats running around, more cats causing problems, more cats preying on wildlife, more cats pooping in people's yards, our best measures of cats out in the community, both of them went down. Cats picked up dead on the road went down 20%, and intake went down of both cats and kittens by almost 30%. So what that told us was actually the old way of dealing with cats was maybe unnecessarily increasing the number of cats hit by cars by 20%. And the old way of dealing with cats that was maybe increasing the amount of cats out and about and needing to come into the shelter by as much as 30%, right? Does that make sense? If it went down with this program, and this was in the face of long-standing low cost, they had $5 spay neuter for years before that, and they had a very robust community-based TNR group active as well, one of the model communities for that. So this was 
on top of that and created new and different progress. And that now has been shown to be a repeatable approach. So this is an even larger program, even more aggressive, almost 12,000 cats sterilized and returned over a three year period in Albuquerque, New Mexico, euthanated down 84%, cats picked up dead down 24%, no change in policy around that and intake down almost 40%. Wow. What a win, right? What a win for the shelter. Decrease in costs of 38% fewer cats admitted. Like, what, can, what else can you do with that money and with that staff time, with those, that housing, to serve other animals in the community better, to educate your community and intervene in cruelty, to help your community prepare for and respond to disasters, right? So a huge win. And I think the, pro, the, the question that, that comes up most persistently still is, what about the wildlife? What about the birds? What about the sea otters? You know, that was a huge concern for me and a huge concern for our shelter. And are we ignoring the impact of the cats in order to make our statistics look better and do better for the cats at the cost of some other little creature? So, I just want to give you some information about cat predation. And this is more just for your interest, um, because as I'll get to, our cat policy um, really doesn't let us decide whether there are cats in communities or not. We just, we, we can't really control that, but I want to talk a little bit about cat predation because I think it's interesting. Um, so it's a huge impact. Um, the the science really varies um huge range of estimates of the impact on birds but we certainly know that in focal areas cats can have a very detrimental impact on species and on islands they can contribute to the extinction of species and certainly indisputably when i was driving around as an animal control officer he couldn't argue the impact on individual lives But it's not just birds, and that is what makes our fractured ecosystems with multiple introduced species so complex to manage. So, so you know, in this slide here is the graph of, of estimates of bird impact spread out. But here's that same graph in comparison to the impact on rodents. Cats kill about 10 rodents for every bird. Um, they're really adapted to hunt rodents more so than birds. And invasive rodents are present throughout North America and are significant predators of eggs and nestlings. Um, we don't see it because the rat, you know, the Norwegian rat out in the alley behind my house doesn't bring the nestling or the egg that it ate into my living room and drop it on my sofa, right? So we don't see it, but that impact is real in communities. Um, and so here are the, the number of species threatened by different types of invasives. Here are cats near the top. Here are rats ahead of cats. And even in Australia where cats are such an issue and you know biologists are frank, they hate them. Modeling suggests that native mammals are most likely to die off where rats and not cats are present. Where both rats and cats are present, in fact, cats have a net benefit in protecting vulnerable species often. Not always, but what we really know is in terms of protecting vulnerable species, we must be very, very targeted and thoughtful about that. We must identify a specific location. We must know the species we're trying to protect, and we must know what the threats are to that species, cats, and what other animals are also a threat. And we can do that in very specific areas where we know that there's a little niche a niche in the ecosystem that's important for a ground-dwelling mammal or a bird. But we can't do that with a broad brush across San Diego, right? And nobody who is bringing cats into the shelter is doing that kind of in-depth analysis. 
And when we are trying to do that with a broad brush, what we're doing is creating inadvertent harm as well as just ultimately being ineffective because we're not targeted enough and we're not doing enough in specific locations. So even if we decided, you know, we're gonna risk the rodent overpopulation and we're just gonna try and get rid of the cat. There is a threshold that is required for eradication efforts to be successful. And it's been well documented that for cats to be, cat populations to be meaningfully reduced by removal efforts, no matter where the cats go, whether you adopt them out into indoor only homes or you send them to an island or you send them to my house, you have to remove at least 50%, at least half the cats. Otherwise, what happens? You left half the cats there and they know what to do. The population just rebounds, right? We kind of know that, but still, when I was bringing in one cat a day, two cats a day, 10 cats a day, I knew I wasn't touching nearly 50% of the population of cats in Santa Cruz County, but I somehow thought that bringing in 10 cats would mean there are 10 fewer cats out there. It's not true, right? It makes no difference at all. And I'm gonna show you some data that suggests it actually creates more harm. And Kate, there we, are one, yeah. Kate, I was gonna tell you, we, if you don't mind some interruptions, do you? No, not at all, jump on in. <laughs> And I know you. We actually did a, did some calculations based on some of the work that you've done and recommended, and I think we estimated yeah. there are between 300 and 500,000 free roaming cats in San Diego County. So imagine if we tried to go for eradication, which we would never do. Right. You can't do it. And that's sort of depressing, but it's sort of freeing too, right? Mm -hmm. You can't eradicate and therefore, you know, pulling out 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or 30,000 out of 300,000 cats, it makes no difference at all. It makes no difference at all. Ultimately, they will just breed back to replace those. And on a daily basis, it's even fewer. If you do the math on it, probably on a daily basis, you're not bringing in more than about one in every 10,000 cats in the community. And so you got to be really smart about which of 10,000 cats you're going to bring in, right? You want the bang for that buck. And this study actually, um, this study came out sort of at early in, in my exploration of this. This is from 2005. Um, removal, intensive removal of coyotes, which are very similar to cats, right? They're like kind of urban, like some people love them. They're kind of a pest species. They're actually, you know, they're closely related to dogs, but because they look different than dogs, we, know, we don't go into the idea that we should manage coyotes and dogs in the same way, and that we should encourage people to like trap dogs, whether they're coyotes or domestic pets, and bring them into the shelter, and then we'll evaluate whether they're feral coyotes or domestic dogs, and then like the feral, the coyotes will try and place in a barn home. <laughs> right, we know. We deal with these separately, but for cats, there's this population of sort of free roaming, unowned feral cats, and this population of pet cats that look the same, and so we try and manage them the same. And that's problematic. But what we know from coyotes is that when you, even if you remove a lot of them, it reduces the population short term, but unless you keep that intensive effort up, within eight months, pack size rebounded, and in fact, there was even more coyotes because of litter size doubled, and the A structure shifted to a greater number of more juvenile animals. That is a problem. Juvenile animals are a problem. They create more health risk. They migrate more. So there's more translocation of disease, more disruption of ecosystems. And there's just more of them because the environment can support more juvenile animals. Now, eventually they'll grow up and stabilize unless every eight months, you remove some of the population, in which case you just chronically destabilize that population and chronically allow there to be more individuals present and more harm caused. So that's, that's how it works with coyotes. So I read that paper and then I was actually, I was like driving home from a shelter consult with a group of interns and talking about this and they were like but how does it how can it work that you can put cats back and it doesn't make more cats and how does it work that you could remove cats 
and it doesn't make less cats. It doesn't make no sense. And so this was a little thought exercise that we went into that I made into this little animation. And um, so this is theory. We know that one in seven people in the United States admits to a feeding cast they don't own on purpose. And we also know that there are many other food sources available for cats, right? There's open dumpsters and there's a bowl of dog food on the back porch. And, you know, there's all kinds of food sources for cats. And we know that that is not something that we can ever regulate because feeding of cats can be done under cover of darkness in an instant. Just slit open a bag of cat food and boom. So trying to regulate that just makes people behave even more badly about it and be even less responsible. We can't, we can't regulate it. We, we need to teach people how to do it in a responsible and constructive way. So just imagine, we know that as litter bearing mammals, just like coyotes, litter size for cats is proportionate to the amount of food available in the environment. So just imagine that there is some sweet person here who is putting out the equivalent of six bowls of cat food every day. And imagine that there's three cats in the alley that have access to those six bowls of cat food, right? This is a well-intentioned person, but she doesn't know, she doesn't know better. So these cats are all intact. There's an R on them because they could all get rabies um, and transmit that disease. And there's an R and a T on the kittens because you know they're not vaccinated, so they can get rabies, and also they can get toxoplasmosis, that disease I was so concerned about for the sea otters. And the thing about toxoplasmosis is that kittens can get it, or cats get it, the first time they eat an infected prey species, and they are the only host that can shed the eggs that are so problematic for sea otters and and also human health threats. Um, but they shed for about two weeks and then they develop substantial immunity. So they're unlikely to be reinfected or even if they are, they shed at a much lower level. So adult mature cats are much less of a problem for toxoplasmosis. So let's say we empower the community to bring one of those cats into the San Diego Humane Society. And it really doesn't matter if the cat is euthanized or adopted out or sent to a barn home, it's not here. And nobody had a conversation when that cat was brought in with either the woman who was feeding or the person who didn't cover the dumpster behind their taco stand or, you know, whatever was that food source, right? No conversation was had because the person who brought the cat in wasn't the person who was feeding the cat. But if that cat came in in good body condition, there was a 100% chance that that cat had access to a food source adequate to feed one cat, right? 100% guarantee there was a food source in the community. Very unlikely that that food source disappeared with that cat unless it was the owner of that cat bringing in that cat, right? So the food is still there. We didn't get all the cats. There's still a couple of cats there. More food. Cat can have one kitten for each bowl of food equivalent, larger litter, rabies risk, unchanged, toxoplasmosis risk, unchanged, number of kittens coming into the shelter next year, unchanged. And in fact, by chronically destabilizing the structure, we give one of those juveniles more of a chance to grow up and turn into an adult cat. So we actually create a system where more cats are supported. Conversely, when we saw the return to field program in San Jose and Albuquerque, we saw a decrease in cat and kitten intake, right? So this is sort of the, the experience, the science and coyotes, the theory, and now think about, whoops, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back this up so you can see the animation. Um, Instead of putting, instead of removing the cat by virtue of her good body condition, sterilize her, ear tip her, put her back. She's spayed, so no more babies. She's rabies vaccinated, so no more rabies. She's mature, so very low risk of toxoplasmosis. And importantly, she knows where the food is. We don't have to find that open dumpster. We don't have to find that bowl of dog food. We don't have to find that sweet lady who is feeding, although she can help lead us to her. 
right? Because she can take her little ear tip and educate someone in a way that we never could. Someone can say, hey, what happened here? Oh, this cat is doing so much better and so much less of a problem. How can I get the other two spayed, right? She can actually change that situation, but at least we know she can go eat that food and not turn it into kittens. And she can reduce the reproductive carrying capacity of the environment in a way that we have never for the previous hundred years of animal sheltering been able to do. And importantly, by utilizing not just the TNR advocates out and about in the community who are passionate about this, but utilizing community members who pick up cats in just ones and twos and threes that make up 95% of the free roaming cats in communities, we access the population of cats that is most likely to come into animal shelters and most likely to impact public health because they live on the border between people and so the wild. They're not the ones who are way out and about. They're not the ones in colonies, which are, are easy to see and they're problematic, but they're easy to deal with. They're the ones we haven't been able to reach before. So that was the theory. And several years after I um, made that little animation and thought experiment, some scientists in Tasmania actually did it. They actually did this. And what they wanted to do is replicate not an intensive eradication campaign, but what could realistically be achieved by an animal control program or by natural resource managers. So they trapped and removed up to one third of the cats present, just like in our thought exercise. And what was important is that they didn't just report, rely on the number of cats trapped to see how well it was working. They took remote cameras and they tracked how many cats were present. They actually took pictures and it was good that they did because fewer cats were trapped every time, but it turned out they caught the bold and the stupid and the hungry and the savvy wild cats didn't go in. And so they thought removing a third of the cats would reduce the population of cats. They didn't know if it would eliminate the population, but this was unexpected. Contrary to what they thought would happen, the number of cats known to be alive in the culling sites increased by over 200%. It doubled the number of cats present. It doubled the number of cats present. And they had test sites where there was no removal, no change. And they also compared to the number of cats present before and after culling, before and after the removal. And after the removal, it stabilized back down to baseline. So that's painful in a way to know that in my efforts to protect cats and to protect wildlife and to serve my community by removing an insufficient number of cats in an insufficiently targeted way, not only was it ineffective, but very likely it was contributing to an increased number of cats present. And that is what we have been doing through animal sheltering for over 100 years. And so that's painful, but it's also great news because this program that is a, like spaying a cat, neutering a cat is one of the easiest, most fun things veterinarians can do. We have this tool and there is no downside to it. So by sterilizing feral cats in good body condition where there's no specific ecological importance of the place we're returning them, it's not a wildlife habitat or a really sensitive area and there's no real risk to them and the cats are in good shape. It reduces crowding and illness and euthanasia in shelters. And that's so important, not just for those cats, but for the cats that really do need the shelters because they lost their home or the owner died of COVID. You know, something happened and they need the shelters to be there. It reduces the birth and relocation and migration of cats with all the risks associated with it. It resolves the source of most nuisance complaints too. Just sterilized cats, they get fat and lazy and they just sit there. And it stabilizes community cat populations more effectively than any other available tool. 
So that's four wins right there. It can even be cheaper because you can get those cats in and out in a day. You don't have to feed them and care for them and change their kitty litter for days and days and days, right? It can be the fastest outcome possible. So yay for that. That was a big part of how we got to the first million right there. It's just return to field. What about friendly cats? This is a slide from an earlier version of this. You can tell because it's like this different uh, ratio from my older computer screen. <laughs> um, originally, when we talked about return to field, adoption was preferred where capacity existed. So if you had the homes for the friendly cats, we thought, well, better to go into a home than to be returned out to where you were living, like in some wild field somewhere. Right, we had the assumption that the friendly cats were needed a new home. And if we could place them in a new home, we should do so. So we really focused on providing face better than death for the cats that exceed adoption capacity. Um, so, you know, this was a, an article from 2011. It was when I, I was at the Jacksonville shelter and, and Prior to implementing return to field, some months their euthanasia rate was over 100% because they were catching up from the month before. Um, it was desperately crowded. And, um, but they had just started this program where the feral cats got to get out of jail free card. They just went off to a spay neuter clinic and never even came in the shelter doors. And I said out loud, I said, God help the ones that purr um, because they went into the shelter there where there was still a very high risk of disease and death. So they invented a category called friendly feral. And they just started putting all the cats right on that pathway, you know, over 10,000 cats a year, like high volume, they just send them all back. Um, because they had a low capacity for adoption compared to the number of cats coming in at that time. But as we have thought about it, I've started to revise my thinking even about return to field as the appropriate outcome for friendly cats Again, when we don't know anything that tells us otherwise, that that's not appropriate. So I want to go over that because that's newer and I think that's a much more, um, it's a harder thing for us to wrap our minds around, but I think especially in light of sort of a newfound awareness and commitment to equity and justice and making sure that shelters are an avenue to serve our whole community and not just the people who look the most like us and who share our zip codes. This has become, to me, a really profound aspect of return to field programs. So they actually are a tremendous vehicle to create equity and allow the shelter to serve truly all the people in our community. And it's like a shortcut to that that we don't have so easily for dogs. I just want to remind you all, return to owner was always our first goal. We didn't want to take cats from people who loved them and who wanted them back and who would worry about them for the rest of their lives. And I say that, you know, I told you at the beginning, I had Pussy Willow from when I was five till when I was 10. And then my family moved from Pennsylvania, from Hop Bottom, Pennsylvania, to San Francisco. And um, we drove. And even though we did not have a lot of money, we were going to spend the money to fly Pussy Willow to meet us because she was just terrible. It's like she would do nothing but yowl and poop and scratch us in the car. Um, so we left her with some friends, and she ran away from the friends in Pennsylvania and was never seen again. And I still think about her, even though she would be. 50 now. <laughs> I still think about her. I still think about Pussy Will. So our first goal is get cats back to people who love them. And our method for that needs to be different for cats than for dogs. Like here's kitten school. We know there are differences between cats and dogs. One is their behavior in school. Another difference is the ways that cats behave when they're lost and the ways that cat behave, owners behave when cats are lost, right? 
so for one thing, when a dog is lost, oftentimes the dog just like lurches out on the street. And he's like, help, I'm lost. Then he like goes up to people and is like, I'm lost. Um, but cats don't, right? When they're lost, usually it's because something scared them. And so they go to ground for a long time. And so oftentimes they don't even emerge from wherever they've been hiding for sometimes a few weeks, right? And then people's search patterns also are mismatched from when cats get lost and when they're in shelters and a stray holding period, even a long stray holding period. You know, oftentimes they wait because they know that the cat sometimes disappears for a few days or even a couple weeks. And so there's a big difference in how successful shelters are at reuniting cats with their owners. We see that in the return rate, you know, often less than 5% for cats across California, um, whereas for dogs, it's somewhere between 20 to 80%. Um, so the green bars are cats, and dogs and the means by which they were returned. This was from over 10 years ago. I think we would actually see probably um, returned by a Facebook post or via nextdoor.com, much more common. But over in 2007, when this was published, call or visit to a shelter was the most common way that dogs were reunited with their owners. Call or visit to a shelter, almost negligible. The vast majority of cats that ever returned, returned home on their own. And so when I read that study, what that told me is by removing cats from the neighborhood where they were lost, we were actually reducing as much as tenfold the likelihood that they would ever be reunited with their families. And that was not a fluke. In a more recent and larger study, only one out of 54 cats that were ever found were returned by a call or a visit to the shelter, whereas almost 50 out of 54 were either returned on their own or by searching the neighborhood that they lived in. So when we remove cats from their neighborhood of origin and don't put them back, we greatly reduce the chance that they will be reunited with the people who love them. How do we know if there's someone who loves them? Because they're friendly. If they're friendly, somebody made them that way. More, even more recent study that showed that cats were more likely to be found inside the actual house where they were lost than by a call or a visit to an animal shelter. And importantly, the impact of this is not neutral across income, and that means it's not neutral across race, across language, across access, across whether you own a car or not, across your immigrant status, because all of those things go together in America. If you make over, this is the percent of lost cats that were never found in America. If you make over $100,000 a year, every time you lose your cat, you get it back. If you make less than $30,000 a year, more than half the time you lose your cat, you never see it again. And shelters have been a part of that, right? By allowing neighbors to pick up their neighbor's cats that they don't think should be living that way or they don't think those people should have a cat and bring it into an animal shelter where we be rehome it sometimes into a home that looks more like us. So this is another ouch moment for me. This is me the year I was 10, the year I lost Pussy Willow, where I randomly dressed up as a cat when it was not Halloween and nobody else was dressed as a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and to think that I might have brought that cat into the shelter, and I actually remember her. Um, she was a friendly Siamese cat with a pink flea collar. And somebody did love her and she wasn't reclaimed. She did get home because she was a friendly Siamese. Um, but to think, you know, looking back, like, oh, my, my intentions were so good. I so wanted to do the right thing for people on cats. Um, but I look back now and, and I feel sad about that. And I look at this image by contrast, and Pussy Willow is a calico cat. And these little boys being reunited with their cat that was part of a return to field program. And it was the first time that anyone in their family had known about spay neuter. You know, it was their first time, their first opportunity to know what it was like to have a spayed cat. That wasn't something that was common in the trailer park where they lived. And you can just see, you know, just see the love and the tolerance of that cat. And so return to field 
for friendly, healthy lost cats can serve such a good purpose. Cats return home in their neighborhood of origin by returning home on their own. And we can take advantage of the fact that some concerned citizen gave them a ride to our spay neuter clinic in the meantime. So we can get them what they need, which is something that, you know, these little boys didn't know how to do. And maybe they didn't have the car, maybe they didn't have the money, but we can actually use the spay neuter program to, to do the transport, to become aware of those cats where otherwise we have to do such a huge marketing campaign to reach this trailer park in like all the different languages we have to put the flyers in and like all the different people we'd have to convince. And instead, like they just get the cat back, voila, it's fixed, it's fixed. Um, and they can, so it can bypass the mismatch in timing. It can bypass the mismatch in search methods. It can bypass people's reluctance to come into an animal shelter, which feels sort of official and sort of scary. And spaying and neutering and vaccinating that cat is gonna decrease her roaming. So it's gonna keep her safer. It's going to um, decrease her disease risk. Just that one vaccination is going to protect her probably for the rest of her life. And those are the very cats that otherwise are maybe with the most fragile owners, the ones who have the least resources to make sure that their cat is taken care of, right? They have the love, but they don't have the money and they don't have the know-how. And so we can just close that loop right away for them, right? So it's magic. And then there's another difference between cats and dogs, which is that like when a dog, when you see a dog out and about on the street in San Diego, there's a decent chance that it is lost. With cats, it's just not true. This is a fun website to check out and, and I've given you these slides so you can check out some of these live links. But this was a very British study of cats. Uh, they put geo-tracking collars on cats and then talked about what they did. Um, and what you can see is that cats do not travel along roadways. They travel across backyards. And so where they show up might be very close as the cat walks, but very long away as the car drives. And so a cat might come into a shelter very soon after it was lost, um, but it might be really sort of not predictable where it actually came in from. And this is a, an interesting, I got an email from a shelter director who started tracking um, where cats actually were lost from and where they were picked up from, and, and then doing that on a little geo map. And this was a cat who was brought in the very day she disappeared. So she really wasn't lost, but she just showed up at this house. This was her house of origin. She showed up here, and you can see, it was a short walk backyard-wise, but a very long drive in a sort of unknown neighborhood for the person who lost the cat. And luckily that cat was microchipped and so was reunited with that owner. But if that person hadn't had the wherewithal to microchip her cat, she hadn't had the money, if it hadn't had a tag on, she never would have seen her cat again. And that also is an uneven impact of cats getting picked up. This is in cat intake per thousand capita versus median income across California. So cats are being picked up more out of poor communities than out of wealthy communities. And we know that one in six people in America live in poverty and one in five people and probably even more in San Diego, I would guess. Such a diverse, you know, that's part of the wonder of it, right? Is it's such a diverse community. Cultural norms and expectations really vary across all, all the different groups that, that live in California with us, right? And some people like, it would never in a million years occur to them that when their cat doesn't come home, it's because somebody picked it up and drove it to a building where it got put in a cage and it will be held for three days. And if they don't show, it up, show up, somebody else gets to adopt that cat. Like it will just never occur to a lot of people that that could happen. And greater than 90% of people in underserved communities have never been to a shelter at all. They haven't called, they haven't visited. It's just a foreign world. We haven't done a great job of building that bridge. And, we, and, and yet we have a tremendous sense of urgency and a well-founded sense of urgency about closing that gap. And here's another thing. Um, across America, over 30% of cats are adopted from shelters, 30 to 40%, depending on what survey you look at. Um, 
but 3% of people in disadvantaged communities have adopted their cat from an animal or their pet from a shelter or a rescue. Um, by far the most common source of a pet is family, friends, and neighbors. Again, in their area of origin. And what does that mean? It means that they didn't get a sterilized cat, they didn't get a vaccinated cat, they didn't get to have a conversation with anybody knowledge about, about animal health and animal welfare to talk to them about identification and maybe keeping your cat inside at least at night to begin with and like what to do, peas outside the litter box. So no connection was made with that adoption. They missed us. And now we got to work hard to get them into the spay neuter clinic, right? Or to get them to the vaccine clinic. But magically, return to field, just close that loop. Cat already had a home by definition of the fact that it was friendly, right? And so maybe it wasn't ever lost, but if it wasn't sterilized, well, very few people really want their cats to be intact. So we get to close that loop, bring it back, and open doors for risk mitigation and for further education and conversation for us to understand, you know, what else, what other challenges those people might be facing. So I would say this, this may not be a concern, but I hear this concern a lot. It's like, but we could adopt the cat into a better home. And shouldn't we adopt it into a better home? But we can help the home that the cat already had be a better home. And even from just a cat centric, even if all we cared about was the cat and not the little 10 year old me who was attached to the, the cat, even if all we cared about was the welfare of the cat, when we adopt that cat out into a better home that already knows about spay and neuter and vaccination, by definition of a friendly cat being in a home, they wanted a cat. They had a little kid who had a cat. Guess what happened after I lost Pussy Willow? I got another cat. Cat wasn't neutered. He peed um, in our house. My housemates got angry and my mom dumped the cat at Fisherman's Wharf because she didn't know any better. So I live what happens when a cat is removed from a household where they're not doing a great job of keeping the cat instead of being returned to the household with some education. So even from a cat welfare perspective, we do better when we return the cats to the homes they already have. We do want to document that they already do have homes, you know, or we at least want to take some care to try and identify cats that truly don't have homes. I have, this was an older slide too. And then this was a much more recent sort of a story of how that played out. Sort of that theory of, you know, sometimes friendly cats that come in are really people's beloved pets. Um, and this was a cat that was returned through a return to field program. You can see the little ear tip on there. This woman had had the cat for more than 10 years, but somebody saw the cat outside and thought it would be appropriate to bring it into an animal shelter. And prior to the community cat program, she would have just been a cat in the shelter and, and you know, an older cat in the shelter for that matter. And she might well have gotten adopted. She was a friendly cat, but this woman never would have known what happened to her. And instead, and I get, you know, I've done this slide like 10 times too. I still get for Clint. Um, just looking at the love in that picture and the gratitude and like how much is that worth to create a moment like that where after 10 years of being a cat owner, she's reunited with her cat. She gets to have the cat spayed and vaccinated and she gets to help other people in her community access those same resources. Like what a great, what a great thing to be able to give. What a great gift to be able to give your community. So this is kind of the new understanding that I've come to is that not only is return to field an alternative to euthanasia for cats that aren't suited to be in a home, but it also is a fast track to reunite cats with their owners and to close the loop on adoptions that have already happened, but that they missed the piece about coming to the shelter and getting the animal sterilized. And so I've come to think about it as sort of setting up super highways for your cats and your kittens to recognize that no one outcome is right for every cat or every kitten that comes to you. 
And you don't want to have to think about what's right for every single cat that presents starting from scratch because that is tiring and you will succumb to decision fatigue no matter how good you are and how smart you are. So you want to set up some pathways and some guideposts to depart from your basic pathways. A way that most cats go, a way that most kittens go when they come to the shelter and some flags for why they should do something different. And if you have sort of like these super highways where like you come in, you're a healthy adult cat with no red flags at your point of origin, you go right on the return to field super highway and you are scheduled for surgery the next day. Um, and if you are a friendly kitten, then you come right in and you are going up for adoption, you know, the next day. And, um, one of the big benefits of that is having when then you reduce your length of stay and reduce your disease risk and you free up so many resources to really take care of the cats that do need your help to really take care of those more co complex cases i'm just gonna i just have to highlight this because it's san diego you may not i sort of i didn't San Diego Humane Society with your double compartment housing with those old laminate cages in your um, building in the little rooms. That was the foundation of this study that taught us that the risk of upper respiratory infection in cats is reduced more than 50 fold by giving them that kind of housing where they have separate area for a litter box and for their food and bed. So, you guys by providing that good housing actually allowed us to learn that and we have now spread that type of housing to um, literally thousands of shelters so yay for you i think kate actually we went on your recommendation to do it <laughs> <laughs> but we listened <laughs> well you took the plunge very early mm -hmm. um so here is my proposed cat superhighway and we can talk about this but the most healthy cats, regardless of whether they're friendly or feral, should be sterilized, vaccinated, ear tipped, and returned to the location of origin. It's great if they don't even become a shelter intake, if you just let people know in your community. You know what? For healthy adult cats, we just bring them in for TNR, and it's just like when you bring your cat in for spay neuter. It doesn't get an uh, intake number in the same way. You know, it just gets brought in, sterilized. If they're welcome, willing to come take it back, hooray. If they're not, you can give it a ride back, but it's just going to go back where it came from. So for healthy feral cats, that's to stabilize the populations in the community and limit euthanasia at the shelter. For healthy friendly cats, we talked all about the benefits of that and as an avenue to open doors with community members who wouldn't go to the shelter. That really opens up the shelter pathway for pet cats. Really, the cats that you don't want out and about are the owned cats whose owners can no longer care for them. You don't want those people to be afraid to bring their cat into the shelter. You don't want there to be any waiting list to bring their cat into the shelter. You want them to have confidence you know, you want to help them rehome that cat on their own if you can, because that's less stressful for the cat and less burden on the shelter and probably feels better. But if they aren't in a position to do that, you want that the doors to be just wide open for that. So that's a flip. We used to feel like we should take in the strays first and the owner surrenders can wait. But really, it's the ones where the owner is struggling and they don't want the cat. They can't keep the cat. They're having a problem with the cat that we want to be able to support them, including by facilitating rehoming that cat. We want to leave the door open for unhealthy free roaming cats, just cats that are skinny. They're not thriving. Someone's not looking after them. Someone's not attached to them or they're injured or they've got an illness or they only have one eye like my, my cat, little Baldwin Park. Um, you want to be able to intervene where there's 20 cats and it's too much. And that way you can reserve your resources to like help people who have gotten in over their heads, plug away at that. Or where there's cats that are in a sensitive area, where there's an ecosystem that's really precious and important to protect. And as an avenue 
to open doors and engage with community members who look to the shelter to help them solve cat problems. Right, we wanna serve both populations. So there's ways that you can really look for evidence that a cat isn't doing well, isn't thriving in the community. Um, and I really wanna, I think I talked about these others, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about them. Um, this is a cat that my neighbor, that, was, that my neighbor, one of my neighbors picked up across the street from me, from another one of my neighbors. And she was skinny. You could feel her spine. And she posted the cat on next door and somebody replied, cat's name is Gracie. We've been feeding them. The owner um, knew that they were abandoned, done nothing, making it all of our issue. So a known that the cat was abandoned, known that there were people who were living there who were caring for the cats who are no longer there. Evidence that the cat's not in good body condition, and also too bad. Like those people, they got evicted, so it wasn't like they were just jerks that abandoned their cats, but like they didn't have a place to live themselves, and they were probably sad to leave this cat who did have a collar on and did have a name. But it would have been great if the shelter had been so open because they didn't have any other cats that they didn't need that they could have just like, yeah, bring the cat in if you're struggling and, and let us, by the way, also help you find some pet friendly housing. So when people have already made efforts to identify whether the cat is truly abandoned, they've already posted it on next door or on Facebook, they've already knocked on some doors, the cat's not in good body condition, it's been hanging around for a while and they haven't been encouraging it by offering it better cat food than when it gets at home. Um, or the cat has returned once and then there's ongoing concerns about it. So we do have a way to differentiate between cats that should go back and cats that probably shouldn't. And hopefully you're working on this, but it can be really helpful. And I think um, the pandemic is actually a really good opportunity to sort of think about having some metered on ramps onto your superhighway. So if you have a lot more conversation with people before they bring a cat in and you can have them do some of those steps. So like, well, did you, did it just show up? Have you been feeding it? Like if it's not starving, maybe don't feed it and see if it just goes home because maybe, you know, cats are just disloyal jerks sometimes. Maybe you're just feeding it something better, but if it's been hanging around for a long time, if you've done your homework, if you've verified that like this is a cat in need, then you really want to open the doors, let that cat be brought in or, help that person solve the problem in another way. If they want to keep the cat, then sterilize it and they get to keep it. We won't quote you on the cats for jerks as, the, as a heading for this talk. <laughs> I, and my cat just jumped off the desk in a sort of offended way that, when I said that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay a heavy price for that later on. <laughs> um, so just a reminder of like, especially at an organization like San Diego Humane that has a really high success rate and like you're able to do amazing things and adopt out cats that like I never could have imagined those cats would have been candidates for adoption back when I first was working in a shelter. But it can really allow those cats to shine who do need homes. And this was just a picture I took and it was from a shelter that had an over 90% live release rate, but it was just like black cat, I'm very sweet, but I dislike prolonged petting. Please keep interactions short. I can go home today, but she'd been in the shelter for 79 days. When there's 50 other friendly, more obvious cats to choose from, she doesn't get a second look, right? But you've experienced probably in the time of COVID, like if there's only one cat in the shelter, people are gonna fight over that cat. Even little Ebony with her little social issues, she's gonna be snapped right up. And so, it really can benefit the cats that do need to come into the shelter. And then I just wanted to touch on this for kittens. Um, and I think I'm right on time here, miraculously, that kittens are not adapted to the environment. Right in that slide set, there wasn't a food source already being utilized for all the kittens in that little animation that I did. It's less likely that a kitten, and the younger they are, 
the more likely it is that there isn't somebody who's already deeply attached to that kitten. And so what we wanna do is facilitate adoption for kittens that are old enough for adoption. And really facilitate, and hopefully you're talking about this too, really facilitate helping people in the community keep the kittens out of the shelter until they're old enough for adoption through foster by finder programs, really reserving the nursery for, for those really, those cases where they are genuinely orphaned. Um, and I, I think this is probably, hopefully not a common situation, but the kitten is not social and could not become social with reasonable efforts. In those cases, we have seen shelters doing return to field even for kittens. And I just wanted to talk briefly about that. Um, ideally, when you're gonna do return to field for kittens, you know, you sort of missed the socialization window and you're like, okay, like even if we manage to socialize this kitten, this is gonna be a cat that like stays under the bed and pees in the laundry basket for the rest of its life. Like this is not a cat who's gonna wanna be a pet. Ideally, you just don't admit those kittens as you know, you don't hold them trying to adopt them out from that time they're 10 weeks of age until they're 14 weeks of age. Um, and instead just have them grow up out in the field and have the people bring them in until they're three months old, when they're old enough to officially get a rabies vaccine. And do make some extra efforts to make sure that the location of return is safe. See if you can make contact with somebody who could keep an eye on them. See if you can actually identify a food source. So where you're putting a healthy adult cat back, you can be sort of assured. It's very likely there is a food source there. There's less assurance. And so I feel like return, I feel less sort of blase about like, it's all gonna work out when you return a kitten, but it still may be preferable to euthanasia for a, for a cat that's, or for a, just a lifetime of stress and months in the shelter for a cat that just truly is not, you missed the window. And not just that you missed the window of socialization, but feral behavior for cats has quite a strong genetic component. And so it may be that even within a litter, some of the members of the litter tame down, but there's one member of the litter that doesn't. And this actually happened um, to me with a litter of kittens that my neighbor found in the alley at about seven weeks, like that awkward age. And so I brought them over to my house and I tamed them down in my bathroom and I got scratched. Uh, and two of the three came down and one of the three just didn't. Um, and my neighbor told me that the mother cat um, just kept crying for two weeks. The mother cat kept crying. The daughter kitten kept being hostile. And so after two weeks, I sterilized her and brought her over to my neighbors. And um, she it was so moving. You know, we wonder like how long is too long to return a cat or a kitten. She, um, the, the, the mother cat was hiding in some bushes and I came over and I, I set down a cardboard box on its side and the kitten waddled out and was like, <coughs> and even though she was feral, the mother cat was very feral, the mother cat ran out um, calling, like that sort of chirpy call. And she put her arm over the kitten and she groomed the kitten all over. And then she sort of hustled the kitten into the bushes. Um, that happened five years ago. The mother cat had actually been living on this person, my neighbor's back porch for nine years at that time. She was old, but for like for whatever reason that year, she was like felt well enough to have a litter of kittens. She had never had a litter before. We got her sterilized too. It turned out she had only one tooth that whole time. She lived another three years, at which point she was at least 12 years old, and she had been a solid adult when, when she was found. Um, and she died curled up on a chair in a patch of sunlight with her kitten beside her, you know, all grown up now. And now that cat, um, huge and fluffy, and I just saw her on my walk this morning, and even though she doesn't want to be an indoor cat, she sits on my neighbor's lap all the time. Like, and my neighbor has a special brush and she sits out there and brushes her. Um, so it's just a reminder that like, sometimes we don't see that outcome, but sometimes it can be a really good outcome even for a cat to return. But we do want to make some extra efforts to make sure it's safe. And then you just want to sort of keep the traffic flowing. I think this is more operational for the shelter. 
but just to consider like what makes sense. One of the benefits of your super highways is that you can sort of prioritize, like if it's really good, you know, it can be really good to bring kittens in and get them all surgery right before weekends in the days when we get to have big adoption days. Um, whereas it can be really good to encourage people to bring in cats that are going to be returned to field candidates, like on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, where we're not trying to prep the kittens. So just making sure that your surgery schedule and your intake practices are aligned with um, sort of who's going where on the superhighway. Um, and you can see the superhighway document um, on the Million Cat Challenge website. Give us your feedback, how that works out for you as a way of framing it. But that really just brings us to um, questions. Perfect time. And I'm happy to to stop my screen share if people want to see it big, but I wanted to show you this cute slide. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hurley. You're, now, I think everybody knows why you're the director of the Corvette Shelter Medicine Program at UC Davis. I know we have a few questions. Alex is going to uh, read a few of them off, but I wanted to ask you um, something that I get asked a lot. What about that cat? And this is somewhat rhetorical, but what about that cat that does belong to someone that doesn't find that owner again? Um, and maybe it's um, somebody who was not able to come to the shelter to ever get that cat. Wouldn't it be better to give that cat a chance to be found by that owner if he or she could get to the shelter? And my answer has been, and tell me what you think, that's true, but it's a percentage game because the number of people that don't get their cats back far outweighs, and it's tragic, of course, that person that could have gotten their cat back had it been that one of 5% of people that come into the shelter. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, and I think partly um, by definition of being intact, that even reduces the rate still further, right? I mean, what's your return to owner rate for San Diego Humane Society in general? In general, it's a, it's really high. It's about 40%. Yeah. But not cats. That's cats and dogs. Cats yeah, last yeah. Year was, for, was for about 11% for us, which is much higher yeah. than the average. Yeah. Yeah, much higher than the average. But And so that's one in, but it's still only one in 10. Yeah. Right, only one in 10 cats that comes get back in, goes back to its owner. So you have to do better than one in 10. So yeah. most shelters have to do better than one in 50. But you have to guess that you're doing better than one in 10. But if you look at, you know, even still, the cats that get returned, very often they're cats that do have some identification. And more often they're going to be the sterilized cat. So the fact that a cat is not chipped, not identified, and not sterilized already means that's a person with just like less wherewithal, like less awareness mm -hmm. of cat care, less resources to get those processes done. Um, less likely to, to know about the shelter, let alone right. come right. into the shelter. And so by reserving this program for cats that are intact, you, you even more increase the mm -hmm. likelihood that cats will be, that, that, that by putting them back, you're increasing the likelihood. Another thing you can do as sort of a, a safety measure is to place door hangers around where the cat is put back. Mm -hmm. And remember, if it doesn't go back home, and it's still like if Gracie's a cat, you know, if she had just been returned, I would have seen her again. And I would be like, hey, wait a minute. You know, she's still hanging around. She's still skinny. So you can always take them back in. Right. Turns out an ear tip is not a barrier to adoption. So um, that can be another way of getting some more information and, and just feeling safer about and about I, the I return. Like what you said about every cat is an individual case that comes into a shelter, especially a shelter like San Diego Humane. So whatever uh, program we have, we will look at that individual cat to make sure that it's thriving, that it could, could do very well in the environment that was found, not a cat who was emaciated or, or not doing well or had other, other issues. And kittens, we, um, we're not quite at the point of releasing kittens back once we have them but at least not before they're six months old. So I, I think it's uh -huh. really important what you said, that it's every individual cat is what should be looked at. Yeah. Well, so and again, I don't advocate kit releasing kittens under six months right. unless they are too feral to be good adoption candidates. But just to recognize that if they're too feral, then that could be a good. You can yeah. see my cat forgave me for a minute there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Alex, do you want to do some questions? Right. Uh, they, yeah. Important to remember, this program is for healthy cats. It is not for broken mm -hmm. cats. Right. Okay, we're going I think to get... when it... Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> questions. We want to make sure we get to some of the questions and if we're not able to get to all the questions today we'll be following up with folks individually so the first question um what is a responsible or ideal way to feed community cats um that's a great question and with return to feel and with putting those flyers back i think it's a great opportunity to sort of start to build those bridges Community cats should be not be free fed. They should be fed at a routine time. They should be fed on an elevated surface to keep the food away from other critters to the extent possible. And they should only be fed the amount that the cats will eat in about half an hour. So food shouldn't be left out sort of ad hoc. And ideally they should be fed, you know, sort of away from public areas where the cats are gonna be causing consternation and that's really important because you don't want the food to be attracting other wildlife species and you don't want the food to be increasing the carrying capacity of the environment either for cats or for other kind of invasive species like rats and um, other problem critters okay in the example where the cat was found in an area that was not close to the home by a car driving path how do you know what area to take the cat back to you still take the cat back to the area where the cat was found because even though it wasn't close to the home for a car, it was close to the home for the cat. Remember, she just had to hop across her back fence, run across a little field and hop another back fence. And she knew well how to do that. As we saw in that study from the UK, like the cats had those pathways that they routinely walked. So she'll be able to find her way home. Okay. What if a cat is found in an apartment complex or managed building and the manager does not want the cat around and can punish residents who feed it? Yeah, I think that's one of those times to, to probably make an exception and not put the cat, you know, if there's a managed colony around the apartment complex, I think that's one thing, right? Then you really wanna work with the apartment manager to maybe gradually reduce the size of that colony over time. And that's one of the reasons why you wanna keep your shelter open for, for those cats. Um, recognizing that, you know, we wanna take euthanasia off the table as a way of managing those cats, because we know that's not a constructive solution. But that's where you wanna, you know, work with the apartment manager maybe to um, post signs, make people aware, make it fair. Um, so people know what's happening. So at least they're not never knowing what happened to their cat and you could maybe facilitate them rehoming the cat if they're not allowed to have cats in the apartment building. Hopefully I'm answering the correct question. <laughs> it's a complex question. I think when there's evidence, <laughs> there's a known situation where the cat is not acceptable. Not, but not just like somebody is sort of irritated by the cat and the finder comes in and they're like, I don't like this cat, I don't want it back. We find in those situations, return the cat, tell the person if it's still a problem, bring it back in. 99% of the time, it's not a problem because it becomes fat and lazy and it just stops causing the nuisance complaints that it was causing. And the other thing is that we, we actually follow up often if there is a, an issue with a, an owner of a building, not wanting cats there, and we'll have officers that periodically check on the cats and the status of that, that situation. Hey, can I jump in, Alex? I just want to sure. I think a lot of people have asked, here's our big fear in San Diego, not any different than anywhere else in California, but we have so many predators for cats. So we, we used to have a stuffed uh, animal that uh, resembled a kind of a coyote in that lobby right behind me here. Just to remind people, don't let your cats outside because they're gonna become dinner. And that's a huge worry in San Diego, like in many parts of California. There's not a great answer that I've found to, to help people. We're all worried about animals that are outdoors that can become dinner. But between the raptors mm -hmm. and coyotes, the cars, uh, do you have, have mm -hmm. you encountered, um, do you have a, an, an answer for that? I don't. <laughs> there's not a there's not a perfect solution for that, right? The perfect solution is everybody is able to keep their cats indoors all the time. Yeah. But remember that by removing cats, we increase the number of cats and we increase the number of juveniles. We destabilize the populations. And so there's going to be those juveniles and young cats are more vulnerable to predation versus like a fat, lazy, non-roaming neutered cat, right? So 
return to field stabilizes the population and reduces risk for cats from predation better than any other tool we have, even though it's still an imperfect tool. And by sterilizing cats that are pet cats, it's easier to have an indoor cat if it's sterilized. So at least we start to open those doors to have those conversations. Like if you think back to the picture of the little boys at the mobile home park, mm -hmm. you know, that might well be a place where there's some coyotes around too. And that can be a first positive contact with an animal welfare organization that can be the door then to have some more conversation about like, hey, you know, you might want to think about bringing your cats in at dinner time first, you know, like feed them in the evening and then keep them inside at night. How about that? And then like, okay, you know, maybe you even keep them inside all the time. Like some cats like that and here's how you can play with them. So it can start to build that bridge. It's mitigation. Yeah. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, we do. What do you suggest with a woman who chooses to continue to feed feral cats and not let them be spayed and neutered? We have pictures of more than 20 cats she feeds daily and recently two litters of kittens and have become a community nuisance to the neighbors. She's hostile to neighbors as well. And the cats are fearless sitting in the street as if they own it. That is one of those situations where like I was talking about like return to field is not appropriate. I mean, for one thing, she might not allow that to happen. But when you have those nuisance situations, that's where you wanna really put the resources in to bring, sometimes you have to bring some, several groups together that might include code enforcement, um, that might include mental health, you know, that might include um, housing enforcement and, um, you know, ideally work with her to sterilize the cats, but it may be that you, you know, in that situation when neighbors bring those cats in, those aren't cats that you return, but instead those are cats that you relocate or rehome. So it is, this is not for those one-off nuisance situations. But as Gary said, it's, it's a sort of percentage game. If you put back the 90% of cats that aren't a problem, you have a lot more resources for those few situations where you have somebody who's really difficult. Okay. You know, you, you stunned me with something a couple of weeks ago on one of, our, one of these, these conferences, return to home. I, I really love that. Not, necessarily, not return to field, return to home. And if more animals are getting back to where they belong, because of us opening our eyes to a new way to approach this, then that's that's the beginning of a win. So I thank you for that. Yeah. And I think, Alex, I, are we- Yeah, I ahead? think that we need to wrap up the questions. A lot of great questions came in and we'll be following up. Thank you, everyone for- Can we send, for... you, Kate? <laughs> Can we send the extra questions to you? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can I answer one really quickly? What should people do if they find a mom and babies and the babies aren't old enough to go to the shelter? Sure. I think the very best thing they can do is to keep the mama safe where they are. Support that mama. You know, if she needs, put some food and water close to her so she doesn't have to go far from the babies. If, you know, put some shelter that she can take advantage of. If she's friendly, like bring her inside. But, you know, trying to encourage people to think from the cat's perspective and keep them out of the shelter and support them where they are. Yep, that's exactly it. I just wanted, to, I wanted to add that one. Thank you. That's the question I had for you up in Sacramento. And by the way, everyone, I know you all have to go, but I forgot to mention something very important. I think now you understand why Dr. Hurley was given $50 million by Governor Newsom to actually help California save lives uh, in animal shelters. I know, I'm not, and because COVID hit, <laughs> that 50 got reduced to five, but I think it's absolutely amazing and a testament to your, your talent and your skill that there's even 5 million for uh, animals and animal shelters here in California. So thank you, Dr. Hurley, you're, you're awesome. Um, we'd all love to hear feedback um, from tonight's lecture and uh, uh, God, we're really gonna uh, plead with you to come back and do this again. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just wanna close by saying, you know, the work that you do and the way that you lead at San Diego Humane Society has changed my thinking and has changed the field. So you're definitely a part of this, you know, the professionalization that your organization has been a leader in um, is part of why the governor saw fit to invest $5 million in animal sheltering. So thank you for all that you do. That is awesome. When are you going to start the Million Sea Otter Challenge? That'll be next.
Oh my gosh. Yep. Totally. Next on my agenda. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Back to you. All right. Thank you everyone again for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hurley. Um, we're already seeing some of the comments come in, uh, folks really enjoying your, um, all the research, everything you shared with us today. Thank you so much. We will be following up with a survey tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. And um, in the meantime, we wanna wish all of you a wonderful evening. Thank you for your support as humane leaders. All of you fuel the life-saving work that we do every day here at San Diego Humane Society. And we are so grateful for your support during times like these. And uh, we look forward to letting you know uh, future Humane Leader events. But in the meantime, thank you again, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much again, Dr. Hurley. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Thank Bye, you, everybody. everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye. Be well.